So in this video, we're going to learn more about the receptors in the eye that make seeing the types of information that we do possible. So you have two types of receptors. You have rods and you have cones. The rods are more numerous than cones. Than cones. Rods are sensitive to low levels of light. They are uh, they also, they're really good at processing intensity, uh, and they can, and in terms of processing light intensity, then they are really receptive, uh, they function well. So you have two types of photoreceptors. You have rods and you have cones. Rods are more numerous in the retina than cones, and they are particularly important because they are sensitive to low levels of light, so they allow you to see in dim light. They're mainly used for night vision and motion detection. And they have only one type of pigment, so they can't see color. Rods can basically only see light intensity. So it's a little bit, it's not exactly black and white, it's more sort of uh, dim versus bright. Cones, on the other hand, are highly responsive to bright light, and they are specialized for color and for high visual acuity. They are mainly located in the fovea and they have three types of pigment that they can process uh, color from three different types of wavelengths. And again, as I talked about before, this is the other reason for high visual acuity in the fovea is that the, co the cones are predominantly in this area. Here is what um, a, co a cone and a rod look like, and they are literally named for the shape. Okay, This one has a cone shape, and this one has a rod shape. So here's your cell body, and then here would be axon, um, as the uh, axon that would connect with other bodies here. And this here is a receptor cell, so it, instead of having dendrites that would connect with other cells, it is specifically designed to uh, process uh, light or visual information. Again, cones are responsive to color, and rods they are more numerous in cones, and they process light intensity. So there's three types of cone pigments that allow us to perceive color. So the three types of cone pigments, they absorb light over a range of frequencies, but they have maximal absorption rates at 419 nanometers, which would be blue or short wavelength, 531 nanometers, which would be green or middle wavelength, and 559 nanometers, which would be red or a long wavelength. And here you can see them in the spectrum here. This is a really nice illustration of how they have these peak intensities, but they can still sort of respond to a range of light intensities. And this is really important because it is likely the ability of the cones to respond not just to, to respond optimally to one peak, as well as to respond to a range of uh, light wave surrounding that peak that enable us to see the finer nuances of color. There are approximately equal numbers of red and green cones, but there are fewer blue cones. These are on the short, the blue cones are in particular on the short end of the, of the spectrum. Now, recall that our retina is comprised of these photoreceptor cells and then we have a series of cells that begin to connect those photoreceptor cells. So bipolar cells, they receive input from the photoreceptor cells. And then you have horizontal cells, which is right here. Okay, These link the photoreceptors and bipolar cells. So already, even at this point in the retina, is visual information starting to be combined across receptors so that it can be transferred for greater processing to the brain. Again, here we have amacrine cells, which also link cells. They link bipolar cells and retinal, retinal ganglion cells. And then you have the retinal ganglion cell right here. These give rise to the optic nerves. So here, these are the dendrites that are going to connect with these other, with the amacrine cells, the bipolar cells, uh, once they receive information that uh, color has been processed, it's going to pass that information down here. And these are very long axons that together, these axons 
axons of ganglion cells, they make up and comprise the optic nerve. So now we're going to go from the receptor, the eye, into the brain. What happens after color or light is perceived by the rods and cones, and it travels down this optic nerve. Here you see the optic nerve right here. And this is important. Uh, this information is corresponds to your visual field. And so this here is your left visual field. When it comes in, it actually activates the side on the right, okay? And then your right visual field activates this side on the left. So again, remember, your brain is contralaterally organized. So the right part of your brain is going to process information on your left, and the left part of your brain is going to process information on your right. And once the information, once the uh, rods and cones are activated, then this visual information is going to uh, travel down the optic nerves. It's going to cross here at the optic chiasm, and then it's going to travel here to the lateral geniculus of the thalamus. You have um, a thalamus as bilateral. You have it on both sides of the brain. So you have the LGN. This Again, this corresponds to the lateral geniculate nucleus. You have an LGN on the right and an LGN here on the left. And so once it passes here into the thalamus, then it's going to move back here to the brain to the primary visual cortices. And this is where you will begin the basic visual processing. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later into, the, into V1. So your visual information travels all the way from the front of the brain to all the way to the back of the, main, the brain. And again, your optic chiasm is the, jump to, is the junction of the optic nerves. And so axons from the nasal inside halves of each retina cross over to the opposite side of the brain. And axons from the temporal or outer halves of each side of the retina, they remain on the same side of the brain. So information from the left visual field, again, goes to the right side, and information from the right visual field goes to the left side. In the brain, the information, visual information goes through the thalamus. The lateral geniculate nucleus is in the thalamus. So remember, this corresponds to that pathway from receptors to the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then it moves on to the primary visual processing regions here. So this, the LGN, this is the thalamic relay nuclei, okay? So the lateral geniculate nucleus corresponds to this particular section or particular part of the pathway. After it goes through the thalamus, then it travels to the primary, secondary, and association cortices. Here is the occipital cortex. It is composed of at least six different visual regions. So the primary visual cortex, this is where information goes first. This is known as V1, okay? This is the striate cortex. The striate cortex receives input from the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. After the primary visual input comes in here, then it travels to these secondary association cortices. So the secondary visual cortex is V2 through V5, and you can see more of this over here. So here's the primary visual cortex, and then it's going to travel out to the secondary visual cortex, which is known as V2 through V5. And this is known as the extrastriate cortex. The, this is an example of the visual processing region of a rat. So here you have the primary visual cortex, Two visual paths emerge from the striate cortex. One route goes to vision-related regions of the parietal lobe, and one route goes to vision-related regions of the temporal lobe. And you can see some of this here, where it passes this way, and passes this way. This is sort of the one, one route goes this way, and one route goes this way. So this pathway from V1, the primary visual processing, to these separate streams is known as the dorsal uh, stream and the ventral stream. So what travels from the primary visual cortex 
dorsally to the parietal lobe. This pathway originates in the occipital cortex and projects to the parietal cortex. This is the how pathway. This is how action is going to be guided towards objects. So the parietal lobe is really important for attention. Attention has a spatial element. And so where you attend to things in space. So visual information that first begins in the primary visual cortex and then basically travels up dorsally into the parietal cortex, that involves how you're going to interact with it, how it's going to be processed. The ventral visual stream, this pathway originates in the occipital cortex and it projects to the temporal cortex. This is the what pathway, and this identifies what an object is. So then you have two pathways, the how pathway, how you interact with it, and the what pathway. What is it? What is it called? This ventral visual stream taps into naming, uh, taps into memory. So if you're going to name objects, it's going to be connected to your hippocampus for activating memories surrounding what an object is. So it is particularly important for identification. Here is the striate cortex. And then here's this, this dark purple is the striate cortex. This light purple is the extra striate cortex. So this is V1, and the extra striate cortex is V2 through V5, okay? So it basically moves from back here out. So the best way to think about this is information comes into the front of the brain. It travels all the way to the back through these uh, thalamic relay. Then it travels sort of back more out to the front to the, towards these association cortices. Your association cortices are going to be in the parietal lobes, in parts of the temporal lobes, and your largest association cortices are in the frontal lobes. So here, this involves how you're going to interact with whatever you see in your environment, and this stream processes what it is. You're going to name it, uh, talk about it. So naming your information in the environment and how you interact with it.